The UN estimates that 4% of global GDP is being laundered every single year. It's like so much money. It's one of the biggest economies in the world. Four trillion dollars a year in crime. That just, it sounds like a fake number. It's the little scams that you see on social media all the way up to the huge organized crime. The UN estimates we only catch 0.2%. This is the biggest problem that no one talks about. All of this crime is happening. It's all for financial gain. And financial crime is the thing that you have to do to then be able to use all that money. If you're not making as much from the thing that you're doing, you just won't do it as much. You'll find other ways to make money. So if we can actually make it harder for criminals to use the gains that they make from their crimes, if we become more effective at stopping financial crime, then less crime will happen. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories, I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Nanda Capital, a venture capital firm of Bites Crime. Today, I talked to Natasha Fournier, the co-founder and CEO of Cable, an all-in-one effectiveness testing platform for financial services. Before Cable, Natasha joined the UK neobank Monzo when they had 100 customers and built and led their financial crime team for five years before starting Cable in 2020 with their co-founder, Katie Savitz. Natasha is one of the most knowledgeable individuals in the world in terms of financial crime which I recently learned is a $4 trillion market or 4% of global GDP. We talk about what all goes into this $4 trillion number, why people commit crime, how they do it, how to stop them, the fastest growing types of crime, and why you've probably committed financial crime without ever knowing it. We also discuss being one of the first employees at Monzo, how to raise a pre-seed round and sign customers without a product built yet, Natasha's strategy for building a unique cap table, and how she got two funds to preempt her Series A in February of 2023. Thanks to Dan Hack at Stage 2 for the introduction to Natasha, and to Caitlin at CRV for the questions. Thank you to Natasha for coming on the show. This was a fascinating conversation, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Before we start, a quick shout out for friend of the show, SecureFrame. Longtime listeners know SecureFrame is the automated security and compliance platform built by security experts. For all things financial services, we're about to learn about cable. For everything else, thousands of customers like Ramp, Angel, and Coda trust SecureFrame to get, stay, and automate their compliance with security and privacy frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 2701, HIPAA, GDPR, and much more. I'm an investor in SecureFrame, and I recommend it to every founder I meet. Join hundreds of other listeners and click the link in the show notes to get started on a demo with SecureFrame's in-house team of compliance experts and former auditors. Thank you, SecureFrame. And now, let's learn about financial crime with Natasha Vernier at Cable. Natasha, how's it going? Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, good. Thanks for having me, Turner. Good to be here. So I'm really excited to chat because your company is operating in the space of financial crime. Can you kind of just explain what that is and why it's important? Yeah, I guess to clarify, we're in the anti-financial crime space. We're not trying to perform the financial crime ourselves, although it sounds better True. that way. My my job title and my, uh, and my previous job was head of financial crime, which I mm. think is the coolest job title ever, but also slightly wrong because I was not trying to perform financial You're not, crime. You're not committed. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Um, <laughs> I promise. We're trying to help companies become more effective at stopping financial crime. So we mostly mm-hmm. sell to banks. Financial crime is the movement of money, trying to utilize money that has been gained illegally. So if you carry out a crime, you're almost always doing that to try to have some kind of financial gain. You steal something, you're trying to get some money from somebody else, you're trying to sell drugs, they're all doing that to make money. And so financial crime is really, how do we then take that money that I maybe made illegally and actually use it? How do I embed it into the financial system? How do I buy my house with it? How do I buy that boat? All of that stuff is financial crime. So it's the getting of the money illegally, it's the moving of it, and it's trying to use it. And I think you've said, you think it's the biggest problem in the world that no one's talking about. I just don't think anyone really, really knows about it, right? I, before I started working at Monzo and was asked to deal with the fraud that we were seeing, I just didn't understand really what it entailed and how big a problem it was. And I remember saying to my family, oh, I'm doing this new thing. It, it's called like financial crime. They were like, ooh, fun. Like, what does that mean? Do you find a criminal, what, like once a week or once a month? I was like, it's happening all the time and nobody, nobody knows. The number, if you go to the cable.tech, your website, four trillion dollars a year in crime. That just, it sounds like a fake number. I mean, it's crazy. The UN estimates that 4% of global GDP is being laundered every single year. It's like so much money. It's one of the biggest economies in the world. How do you define crime? Like what goes into that $4 trillion number? It's a lot of things, which does make it difficult to then sort of pin down, but it's everything from drug trafficking to environmental crime, ransomware, corruption. It's the little scams that you see on social media 
all the way up to the huge organized crime rings selling drugs across borders and, and the big headline story. So it's all of those things. And I think you said that basically the majority of this crime is happening for financial gain. Most crimes are committed to make money. And so I was coming up with this, I called it the financial crime equation. I was looking at the Office of National Statistics in the UK. They list out sort of what crimes are carried out every year. And it lists out, you know, fraud or all these different types of crime. And if you actually look at what is the purpose of of somebody stealing something? What is the purpose of like a robbery or a theft? They're all to make money. They're all to get something that they can then sell to have a financial gain. And when I ran through that list that the, the ONS put up, over 80% of those crimes, ultimately the purpose of them was to make money. And so if more than 80% of all crime, just crime generally, not financial crime, if 80% if of crime is being carried out for financial gain, to be able to use that gain actually in the financial system to, to buy your coffee or to buy a house, you have to perform financial crime. This is the biggest problem that no one talks about. All of this crime is happening. It's all for financial gain. And financial crime is the thing that you have to do to then be able to use all that money. And I think I've heard you say before, if you're committing some form of like theft or like a local police or kind of trying to track someone down or stop certain crime from happening, it's all tied to the financial system. So I've heard you propose we should stop the ability to do it on the financial end, and that will actually stop the original source of the crime. Yeah, that's how we think about it. That's like a bit of a hypothesis that we have. So in all those movies or TV shows, it's always like, follow the money. That's true, right? Like you have to follow the money and be that digital or like fiat currency, whatever it is, somebody is carrying out a crime to make a financial gain. They then have to move that money, get it into the financial system. If you follow all of those crumbs that have been left and you make it harder for somebody to actually utilize the money that they have stolen or the gain that they've made, then they're not going to carry out the crime as much, right? If you're not making as much from the thing that you're doing, you just won't do it as much. You'll find other ways to make money. So if we can actually make it harder for criminals to use the gains that they make from their crimes, if we become more effective at stopping financial crime, then less crime will happen. The UN kind of estimates we only catch like 0.2% of, of all this stuff. Why can't we catch it? I think there are a few different things that go into that, a few reasons why it's really hard to stop and why we're bad at it. I think some of it is like traditional structural issues with banking and how traditionally slow banks used to move, right? Like they're just hmm. huge, huge, huge organizations with very, very old technology. They were also not incentivized to stop financial crime. All banks are incentivized to stop fraud because it hits their PL. So if, if somebody carries out fraud, a consumer loses money, very often the bank will pay that back and the bank will be the one to take the loss. And so if there is high fraud at a bank or a fintech, then that financial institution is the one directly impacted. This is why all the fraud in the UK that was happening to fintechs like Revolut and Monzo and in, in the US with Chime, that's why that was such front page news, right? It's actually impacting their bottom line. How can you IPO, how can you become a profitable business when your fraud rates are so high? But the other types of crime that are much more prevalent and fill up much more of that $4 trillion bucket, the money laundering, the drug trafficking, the corruption, the requirement that banks have is to identify suspicious activity and then to report it. They are not financially incentivized to stop it. And so that provides like a, a weird imbalance in the incentives that banks have traditionally had. What's really interesting, I think, and the question that we often get asked at cable is why would anybody want to buy cable if it tells them how much more work they have to do to become effective at stopping this? And what's really interesting, I think there's a, there's a whole load of reasons why they should buy cable that I mean, we can talk about later. But I think that people are changing. There have been some surveys done of consumers and a large number of consumers care if their bank has knowingly been involved in financial crime or, you know, people cared that their banks had banked Trump or Epstein. People didn't want to bank with those banks because they didn't want to be connected to that kind of attitude or, or those kinds of stories. And I think we're seeing a little bit like the generational shift around maybe climate change. People care more about what they do with their time, where they shop, who they spend their time with. I think people also now care who they bank with and what that says about them and mm. the impact that it can have on society. What's kind of the process then? Like if I'm a criminal, what am I usually doing to like 
get around these certain controls like do the banks just not watch closely and it's like pretty easy to commit some of these certain types of crime or like how does it usually play out there's a whole range right so you've got the individual criminal who is sitting in his bedroom or her bedroom and that he or she creates a a scam on facebook you know selling air jordans for like a thousand dollars or something and those don't exist and they make a thousand dollars and then they just disappear and then you've got kind of the the middle of the range type crimes where maybe you've got a a small enterprise, a small group of people who work together to carry out crimes. And so you might have somebody who is controlling a group of what we call money mules. And a money mule is somebody who is being used to launder money, maybe without actually knowing that they are being used to launder money. So an example of this, this really spiked during COVID. People obviously were on furlough or had been made redundant at home, spending a lot more time on social media in need of money, in need of easy ways to make some more money. There were lots of adverts around, you know, become a payroll provider for our nursery. And you're like, okay, I can do that. What does that mean? You look at the details. It says, you know, work for us from home, from your sofa, two hours of work a day, and you'll make 500 pounds or whatever it might be. They may have to actually send in their passport and go through an interview process to get this job. And what the job is, is, okay, so you're running payroll for our nursery or our childcare program. Um, You will receive payment and you need to then pay all of our teachers. So you'll receive a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars. Then you send out a hundred dollars to these nine people and you keep a hundred of that. And that's your payment. And you're like, okay, cool. Well, I went through an interview process. I provided my passport or my, you know, my work documentation. And I'm moving this money for this company that I can Google because they're on company's house in the UK or they're registered somewhere. And that person has become a money mule and they are receiving illicit money, illicit gains, gains that have been made from carrying out a crime. And they are sending it on to maybe nine other money mules that don't know what they're doing, or maybe back to the criminal enterprise itself. And they are keeping a hundred dollars or a hundred pounds, but that is criminal money. Now that was a a really common way that people became involved in money muling um, during COVID. And what's even smarter about this crime is that they've also handed over their passport, right? So probably that criminal enterprise is also carrying out fraud and signing up for new bank accounts as them because they've spoken to them. They maybe have taken a screenshot. They can have their passport. They can go through an identity verification process for a fintech or a bank. So it's like a multifaceted crime. That's like a kind of middle of the road, but still organized crime. I'm assuming this nursery doesn't exist. Nursery does not exist. But if you use something like, you know, a nursery or childcare or a school or a hospital, then you think it's legit and you go through an interview process and so on and so on. So then what's the bigger scale? Well, the big stuff is the like the Pablo Escobar, like huge drug rings where you can literally think of them as as large corporate entities. They consider themselves to be companies. They probably have a finance department. They probably have a CFO. They probably have a, a marketing team people who are very, very skilled in accounting and in actual legitimate jobs, but they work for criminal enterprises. And their whole job is how do we move money around the world and spend it on stuff and avoid being caught? Those cases, I think you probably have less and less confidence that you'll ever catch them. If you stop money, you don't know whether it's from a from a huge ring or from like a middle of the road type criminal gang. When you're working in a bank and you're seeing these money movements, all you have to go by if you're working in a single bank is, okay, I see this money coming in to this account that belongs to Joe Bloggs and the money is going somewhere. And so firstly, who is Joe Bloggs? What information do I have on them? And then the only other information you have is what do the normal transactions coming in and going out look like? And does this look the same? Does this look genuine? And so you're trying to piece together this story and work out whether what's happening is actually suspicious or legitimate. What are the tools or the strategies that people use? Is it spreadsheets? Like, do they work with the FBI or like Palantir or something? Like, what tools are out there? And maybe we can talk like pre-cable because I know you're kind of solving this, but like, how how do they historically (laughs) do it? Almost all of the financial crime investigators that I've spoken with or worked with on that would love to be able to, to speak with the FBI and actually be able to be involved in finding these criminals. But like, disappointingly, you never do. The job actually stops when you send off a report and then you hear nothing. Well, certainly that's the case in the UK. Because you have like a front row seat of like, we see these transactions happening. You would think that piecing together all these different parts of the chain would make it easier. Yeah, 
you'd think that's what the government entities are doing. So that's what the FBI or the in the UK, the National Crime Agency, that's what they're doing. They are trying to piece together, okay, I've received this one report about Joe Bloggs from Bank A. I've received this other report from Joe Bloggs from Bank B. I'm going to try to piece together all that information. The tools that people use, how do they actually stop it? Is it spreadsheets? So it might be spreadsheets when you start a company. When we started uh, Monzo and we had our first, what they're, they're called transaction monitoring rules. So you'll be monitoring transactions to try to identify suspicious behavior because you, you simply can't look at all the transactions, of course. The first way that we did that was in Looker, just with some simple rules, pulled together once a day a list of user IDs that deserved further investigation. And then we migrated that into an internally built transaction monitoring system. There was machine learning in there. There were rules-based rules. And there are lots of very good transaction monitoring vendors out there that people buy. So Unit 21, Comply Advantage, 4KI, all of those types of companies do this. And they all use a variety of rules-based rules and uh, machine learning rules. So do you know what they look for? Are there certain patterns that like trigger a crime, fraud, burglary, human trafficking? What are the signals that trigger this stuff? They're looking for a mixture of known typologies. Typologies is the term that we use to talk about a particular series of events or actions that could indicate a crime. And I'll give an example in a second. But they're looking for a mixture of typologies, but also unusual or anomalous behavior. So if I, Natasha Vernier, I'm always receiving about this much money in per month and I'm spending that, if I suddenly receive a lot more, that might be flagged as an anomalous thing that somebody might look into at the bank and try to understand if it was legitimate. But typologies is what's really, really interesting. So a typology, as I said, is a series of events or actions that a customer might take that could indicate that a financial crime has taken place. So for example, there is a typology in the in the UK. If there is a, a male in their early to mid 20s, they live in or around an area of England called Birmingham, and they spend money uh, late night and early mornings on Eastern European airlines and on larger than average spending at fast food restaurants like a KFC or a McDonald's and taxi companies. That is a typology that could indicate that that person is involved in human trafficking. Now, of course, not everybody who does those things, who buys a flight to an Eastern European country or spends money at KFC is involved in human trafficking. But we know that generally a series of events like that may indicate that that person is involved in human trafficking. Often women are trafficked from poorer Eastern European countries and they are brought mm. to places like England. And then they are made to work, to work as prostitutes. So they are mm. taking cabs, taxis early morning, late at night to and from clients. And then a single person who is controlling this group of women, usually a man, may go to a fast food restaurant at the end of the shift of work and buy food for 10 women who have all been working all night long and take that home to them. So those are the sorts of things that you kind of piece together as you think about a typology. And I'm assuming you probably found that from a case that actually got solved and you kind of can take those patterns and apply them across other transactions or other accounts or something like that. Yeah. So what you're always trying to do is identify not only an individual instance of crime. So, okay, this person looks suspicious to me, but also patterns. So, okay, I've had, I've had 10 of this type of thing. What are the similarities between these accounts that have made me suspicious of all of them? And once you identify a certain number of accounts acting in the same way, then you may call it a typology. You'll probably build a transaction monitoring rule specifically to look for that kind of thing. So in that case, you've probably found some sort of instance of human trafficking. If you're the bank, do you usually relay that to the government entities and then it's kind of off your hands and you just kind of watch it keep happening and just wait for the, the government to like intervene? Like, how does that usually play out? Sometimes very like that. It can be it can be quite demoralizing. So um, I remember when I was at, at Monzo, we found some suspected human trafficking and we our onboarding flow was looking at, we used identity verification providers to take a video and you'd hold up the phone and say, my name's Natasha and I want a Monzo account. And it would help you on board so that the bank could understand that you are who you say you are. And we were seeing a lot of these videos with uh, women in the same room with the same table and tablecloth and they had bruises on them. So we could see that these women were probably being forced to carry out the identity verification to open an account. And we submitted, yeah, all of this information to the National Crime Agency. And then very often you hear nothing back. And you as a bank 
decide on your own risk appetite as to whether you will keep accounts open or close them. And banks have different views on this. It's, it's totally down to their own risk appetite. Then you have to make a decision of, do you continue to bank these people? How many times do you become suspicious before you decide to exit them? Uh, and so on. Wow. It's kind of demoralizing. It is. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the stats that I find the most interesting and the most demoralizing and depressing is four in every 1,000 people in the world is in modern slavery which means that they are in forced labor or forced marriage. They've been forced to marry someone because somebody else made money from that, or they're being made to work probably in horrible conditions on a drug farm or something like that. Four in 1,000 people. I mean, 1,000 people is not that very, not that many. We all know more than that, far more than that, which is horrifying to think about. That's like the entire population of London and maybe plus... Birmingham or Newcastle, pretty big number when you really think about it. That's crazy. So then when you're when you're looking at some of these large scale enterprises, is there usually like a real business? Like, let's say very popular drug, they're smuggling it into the country. But is there like some kind of manufacturing business that's attached to this? Or maybe it's like an agriculture business or fishery or something like and they can kind of hide these transactions with a real thing that just makes it even trickier because that why it's so hard to catch some of them the kind of breaking bad example of they're doing some legitimate stuff but some of it's uh an ozarks you know where they've got all these businesses and they do run a bar but some of the money is laundered Certainly that that happens a lot. And that's why Ozark, I think, was probably so popular, giving some real life examples of how it actually happens. It's often the case. I mean, we don't know in a lot of cases as well. And or I should say, I don't know. And there are probably a lot of government entities that do know. But it's yeah, that's often the case. Bars, strip clubs, any cash intensive businesses, those are commonly hmm. used for laundering money through. I listened to this really good podcast on the history of Las Vegas and a decent amount of Las Vegas was kind of funded and built by the mob because it was so cash based. And they're like, hey, these are actually pretty good businesses, but this is the perfect setup to also hide other illegal activities that were obviously partaking in throughout like the last century yeah. that the mob did. I think it's just how prevalent it is. Have you ever had a cleaner and you've paid them cash? Maybe. Have you ever gone to a car wash and it's like a one of the ones where the people do it themselves, not like an uh, an automated one, and you've paid cash. Possibly. Those are risky businesses where those people may not be paying tax. That's tax evasion. That's financial crime. So even without realizing it, and even as a good standing citizen and thinking that you're following all the rules, you probably have, you know, met people or maybe even unknowingly partaken in what becomes financial crime because wow. it really does touch everything. I'm gonna have to edit that that portion out about admitting to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll yep. leave it in. I, I guess a lot of people have speculated with crypto. This was like this whole new window or world for committing. Like, do you know what percentage of some of that stuff was illegal activity or was it really just kind of gambling and were actual business activities? I have found some stats to to help with this, but um, they're certainly not from cable or from me. So chain analysis is really good at um, releasing information about this. So definitely the amount of illicit activity is increasing in crypto, but the numbers are still mm. really, really, really small. So the share of all cryptocurrency activity that was associated with illicit activity has increased over the last number of years, but it's still at like 0.2%. 0.2? 0.2, sorry, language wow. barrier. Uh, zero point. <laughs> is, is that how you say it in the in the UK? It you guys is. Nor, we say nor. Nor point. Yeah. Interesting. And, okay. and midday means very specifically 12 p.m. noon. Midday just means noon. Midday wow. does not we mean are... the period of like 10 till 4, just so you know, if you have any English friends. We are learning about crime and we're also learning about English language differences between, <laughs> dif between the continents. It will help oh. you. Don't worry. We also consider yeah. ourselves to be English, usually not British. Anyway, I digress. 0.2%. Because so much was being moved through cryptocurrencies, that did correlate to $20 billion over the last year. So $22 billion of illicit use of cryptocurrency activity, but that's such a tiny percentage of the overall amount. Who knows what that even means? Someone would make up an NFT and then it would trade for $20 million and like that $20 million is just made up out of nowhere. Fascinating. The evidence from Chainalysis about $20 billion of financial crime that was committed over the crypto rails in 2022. 2022, yeah. So how pervasive is fraud and crime like across the economy? We think it's about 4% of GDP. That's kind of like the number that you think is a fair number to state. That's the last number that I think anybody has that 
we can use. It's the last number that the UN came out with. So that's the number that everybody will quote to you. There's no way to measure how much it is other than like self-reported fraud. Self-reported as in you've been the victim of it, I suppose. Uh, not not if you're carrying it out. Hey, I did this thing. The IRS will be like, hey, if you committed fraud this year, make sure you admit the income on your taxes. I don't know if you've seen that, but that's <laughs> this is literally on the IRS website. It's like, make sure you report your, your crime financial gains. I wonder how many people fill that in every year. They maybe they, they probably catch some people. I bet they catch at least oh, one person maybe. every year. Like, oh I forgot yeah. I forgot about this money I stole. But I mean it's it's just endless. There are some reports that say synthetic ID fraud is the fastest growing uh, mm. type of fraud in the US that cost six billion dollars last year. What does that mean? Synthetic ID fraud. So it's taking different bits of a real person and like making up a new identity. So you may pass a credit check with different elements of somebody else. And so it's it's really making up new identities using true pieces of other identity. You know, you're persuaded to give somebody your ID or there's a, a data breach at a company and they get a lot of information. They could use all that information. What do you think is kind of, I guess, like the next frontier of fraud, if that makes sense? Or like, what do you think is kind of coming next? You talk about the synthetic IDs. Like, is there a new kind of wave people are starting to commit, but then also pick up on, on the, the enforcement side? AI is the obvious thing to talk about, but everybody is already mm. talking about that. So it's probably not anything new. People are being able to to make deep fakes or voice spoofing. If you receive a, a voice note from your mom and she's like, I am stuck at this supermarket and I can't pay my bill. Can you send, you know, here's a link to pay my supermarket bill. It's like $500 or I don't know, something else that if it sounds like your mom, probably going to believe it. And that's now possible because of AI. There are lots of scams that happen over phone or email. It's mm -hmm. really easy to actually to make it so that uh, you call somebody or you text somebody and it says from HSBC or from the IRS, the actual name that appears on your phone is really easy to spoof. So that's already really, really easy to do and happens a lot. I received a text the other day from a legitimate looking company saying that, you know, I, the payment hadn't gone through and could I please retry this link? And it's, of course, a scam. You know, if you're buying a lot of stuff online, you may not know, you click it, you put in some details and you've lost some money. I've gotten that before with, with FedEx and um, AT&T payment, I think. It's probably like every two weeks I'll get a text like your FedEx wasn't delivered and I'll be like, this is not, this is not right. It's actually also really interesting how much easier that seems to be in America. I've just moved to the US from England and I have had the same phone number for 15 years, maybe in the UK. And I received maybe, maybe a handful of those texts or phone calls ever in the UK. And I have had my US phone number for five months and I've already received multiple texts and calls. So there is some low control bar happening in the US with phone numbers that just make it so easy for people to find numbers and to try and scam you. I have a hypothesis around this. Mine started when I signed up for a domain with GoDaddy. I'm putting them on blast. Did you happen to do that recently? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I swear to God, they sold my information. <laughs> I think probably lots of companies do it because there are more like more controls around that from Europe which obviously the UK is no longer part of. You asked about like new frontiers and fraud and like things that might might happen. The thing that I think is probably particularly worrying is actually like for the first time in a really, really long time, people of our generation are earning less than their parents did or are less able to buy homes or cars or pay for education for their children. And usually it was the case in, in most recent history that every generation had the chance to sort of better their parents and to earn more. Yep. And with a whole generation of people really struggling to pay for stuff that would normally be considered, you know, you know, a necessity, a place to live, a car to drive, especially in a country like America, which is so vast, you need a car. There's a lot of people who just can't make ends meet and are dissatisfied, probably a bit pissed off with the government and are sitting at home wondering how on earth they're going to pay their bills this month. And if there are more easily accessible scams, you can claim naivety and you can make money really easily. Why would you not become a payroll provider for a nanny company? I'm really interested then learning all this stuff that you've learned. Maybe we can talk about the Natasha kind of like life story. You worked at Monzo. How did that job come about? So I was working in corporate finance. I had done a law degree, realized I didn't like law. I went into accounting. I became an accountant because if mm. you don't like law, I guess the most obvious thing is then to become an accountant. Or They're something. both really dry and boring. and Exactly. So I went into <laughs> that um, and I became an accountant and I worked in corporate finance for five years and also hated that um, and then wanted to get into tech and didn't know what that was. And I was lucky to have a very good friend who was building a startup in London back in sort of 20. 14, 2015. 
uh, which was very early for the, that scene in London. We talked a lot about what tech was and how to get into it. And I decided that the next interesting area to get into in tech that might become big at that time was fintech or at the time it was called challenger banking in the uk and there were a handful of companies doing that and monzo was one of them there were two startup fintechs that managed to get banking licenses really really early on monzo and starling um, in the uk and so monzo is one of the earliest fintechs in the uk they have an actual banking license they are a bank they now have over 7 million customers they've got the highest nps of any of the banks in the uk i think that's still true they are it's a really really great banking product they offer savings credit cards all that kind of stuff now and i joined when we were about 17 people and we had about 100 customers it was before we became a bank 100 customers okay they were we were not a bank so they were what we called prepaid card customers we were using wire cards banking license, which is amusing given they, how the wire card story ended up in a <laughs> yeah, fraud, okay. fraud related story as well. Yeah. Nothing to do with Monzo, to be clear. So then how did you get that job at Monzo? How did you know that Monzo was a thing? And how did you convince them to hire you? Just, you know, lawyer, accountant, corporate finance person. Yeah. So I had decided that like fintech or challenger banking was the best place to go if I wanted to be in tech. And I knew a little bit about it with my background. And I did some Googling and found that there were, at the time, there were like four startups trying to become banks in the UK. There was, uh, it was mm -hmm. called Mondo at the time. That was the original name. Mondo, Starling, Atom, and Tandem. They were the four. I don't include Revolut in that list because at that point they were very much pitching themselves as just Forex and I was wanting mm. to work for a, a bank rather than a just a Forex company. And then wasn't there one called M21 or N21 or something? N26. N26. Were they were they not in the UK? <laughs> and there is a US fintech called M1. Um, the N20, okay. N26 is, uh, they're based in Germany. They oh, did Germany. actually, okay. they expanded to the UK for a while. I think they're no longer in the UK, but they're in a few other European countries. Yeah. I need to get my so, European fintechs all sorted out. Yeah, apparently. all squared away. The original well, fintechs. Um, yeah, now now I've yeah. got it though. If somebody quizzed me after this episode, I'll, I'll get it right. So I, yeah, found these four. I decided that um, Monzo were were doing it the right way. I really liked the the founder and, and CEO, Tom Blomfield's sort of approach and the things he talked about. And I contacted them. They, I think there was a job online for an engineer and a marketing person. And then there was like a, if you're smart and you think you can help, email us and we'll chat. And I contacted Tom and I was like, I want to build a bank. And this is what I would do if I were to build a bank. And I had a very strange interview process, actually, because it was before they had an interview process. At that time, they may have only been 10 or 11 people because I, I delayed my start. I'll explain why in a second. So it was really small. And I went and met them in the pub. And then we went to a piano bar one day. And then I went and met them at the office. And then they asked me to organize an event to, to do my interview process, which I did. And then I, I got a job. And I was originally just coming on board to be like a business operations analyst, just to do anything that I could to help make the startup still live. There was someone else also doing that role. So I was coming in to sort of work with her to, to just do stuff to help Monzo succeed. And before I joined, though, I went to San Francisco and I learned to code. I did a coding boot camp, which was amazing. So that's why I then delayed my start at Monzo by about three months to go and do that. Did you feel like that was a necessary thing to get a job at a startup? No, I did not understand how if somebody wrote some numbers and letters into a computer here, somebody on the other side of the world could like interact with it. I just did not understand how that would even work. And I just thought that if I was ever going to have kids, they would know this stuff and I would not understand it at all. So I was just interested in understanding how it worked. Turns out I sure. loved it. And another path I could have taken uh, was just to try and be an engineer forever because I loved it so much. Really goes very well with my kind of black and white mentality of and you know being able to solve problems really easily. So I really really enjoyed it. So were you able to apply some of it when you came back and started at Monzo? Uh, not as an engineer. I tried for about a month and then I realized mm. that my three months of coding in a different coding language did not help me be able to build a bank. It was like, yeah, we're okay. building a payment processor. And I was like, I think that might be above my <laughs> above my skill level. So uh, no, I didn't. But I then, after about four months of being at Monzo, we had some fraud and I was asked to deal with it. And I became like the one person financial crime team. And I think that financial crime or financial crime detection is really the perfect combination of law, accounting and coding. 
because you're applying regulation, you're trying to understand it, you're looking at money movements, the ins and outs of it. And then the solution is very often rules-based, working with engineers and, and building systems. Mm. So I think actually it was a perfect combination of everything I had done, which was purely by chance. I wish that had some degree of me putting the blocks together, but it was just, just by chance. So before we dive a little bit deeper into that, you said something I thought was really interesting. You said you thought Monzo had the best approach out of all the challenger banks. What do you think was right about their approach versus the market? It's a good question. And I think it's actually a really interesting debate. The whole Monzo, Starling, Revolut kind of race that happened in England and in Europe is really fascinating. And I think there's a whole couple of hours we could talk about with them in mind, which we probably shouldn't get into in too much detail. But at the time, Monzo and Starling were trying to get banking licenses. Atom was focusing on mortgages. So they were not trying to be like a consumer bank. And Tandem, the founder had done some other stuff before. And I, th I think I was just more interested in sort of Tom's approach to things and the way that he spoke and the way that he was. So really, I guess the, the two that it came down to were Monzo and Starling. And it, as it turns out, they had started off as one company and then split. And there's a lot that you can read about that online. That, um, I was not there for it. So I don't have firsthand information for you. So everything I would say is secondhand, but interesting backstory to, to Monzo and Starling. And I, I like Tom. Um, I thought he was Tom and Jonas, the CTO. I thought they were doing really, really smart things and approaching the whole bank from the ground up. They were not buying a payment processor. They were going to build it all, which I, I thought made a ton of sense because the fundamental ways that you improve the customer experience is being able to control everything in that flow of money. And they were doing mm -hmm. that rather than buying systems to help them do that. That's incredibly hard, though. Yeah, they did it all. It was amazing. I think that they had some of the best engineers I've ever met just in this small run. There just a handful of them who were absolutely brilliant. The whole Monzo Starling Revolut ultimate journey is a really interesting one. Like Monzo took a very community focused approach. It was a great place to work. Almost everybody who worked there really loved it. And they were very thoughtful about things that they did. They got a banking license. And that meant that releasing products had to go through committees and processes and sometimes to discussion with the regulators. And then on the other hand, of course, you've got Revolut, very much more, I guess, of the kind of move fast and break it mentality, maybe the Silicon Valley mentality. People, I think, either love it or hate it working there. And I certainly know people who love it as well as people who didn't. And they did not get a banking license. And that meant that they could release products super, super, super fast with way less controls around it, way less sort of committees and process and, and regulatory involvement. And so they, there is no doubt that they released more products way more quickly than Monzo, but then they have struggled to get a banking license. That's been a hot topic in the press this last year. The will they won't they get a banking license. They keep saying they're really, really close to getting it. The regulators keep saying they don't have it. Keeps going back and forth. Who, who knows if they'll ever get it? What happens to that business if they can't get it? If they cannot become a bank, what happens to their 20, 30 million customers and that money? How insured is that? Will they be able to continue to exist? And that's really interesting, especially if you start to think about the shifting regulatory landscape in the US where the regulators are getting much more involved with the fintechs who are the customer facing product who are not directly regulated. That is the situation mm -hmm. with Revolut. And so without those controls in place, without all of those, you know, the, the process that's, that is needed if you're a regulated entity, what does that mean for Revolut longer term? And do you think, at least from what you've seen from your data, do neobanks or challenger banks, however we want to define them, this new financial services companies that are digital first, is there a higher rate of financial crime that passes through their, I don't know, like gross transaction volume percentage? Or is it probably pretty similar or less than kind of the incumbent banking system? There have been a lot of articles. There was one in America recently, last year, I think, about how fraud rates at the fintechs was a lot higher than at traditional banks. At Monzo, we prided ourselves on our fraud rates being really, really low. So we measured mm. it all and we had lower fraud rates than the industry averages by quite a significant amount. And we released blog posts explaining that. But generally, yes, I think there has been higher fraud at as a as a sort of general industry. So then how long were you there? I couple like this was like four or five years, right? Yeah, four and a half years I was there. So I left Monzo at the end of April and my wife was expecting our first baby. And I knew I couldn't kind of leave and not have a salary. So I spent about three or four months working at some good friends financial crime consultancy. It's called FinTrail. And I spent the majority of that time really writing the business plan, speaking to customers about cable. And I did a hmm. little bit of consulting work for them that Fintrail then helps precede, I should say, cable, um, which, yeah, was the sort of deal there. Was there a moment when you were like, this is the idea for cable, I have to do this? 
December 2019, I, I took that whole month off. Um, I was super burnt out. I was really, really stressed. And I had been wanting to take a break since about February of that year. But I had to hire a senior management team into the financial crime team. I had been doing financial crime at that point for like four years. And I was hiring people from like Barclays and HSBC who had been in the industry for 20 years to report into me. Like the whole bank was very much shifting from startup to proper bank, which it had to do. What was like the size of Monzo and like the valuation of the company at the time? This was like multiple billions, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we had, but when I left, we had four and a half million customers. The team was like 1500 people and we were worth yeah, a couple of billion. And then what is it at today? You said about 7 million customers? If not more. And the last valuation was four and a half billion. Monzo was a real business. You were trying to hire people that had decades of financial crime experience to augment everything you were doing. You took yep. this time off. What happened during that December? I spent a month wondering, like, do I want to go back? I was so stressed. What should I do instead? I spoke to a lot of people and I went back in January thinking, I'm going to see how it goes and I might look in the future. And on day one, I was like, blood pressure up here, just like heart palpitations, just super, super stressed. Can't stay here. I need to get out. What was so stressful about it? I think I had just gotten to the point that I had, I felt so invested in its success, but I was not a founder and I was not somebody, I was not a C-level employee either. And I couldn't control the direction of the company. And this is not to say that my ideas would, would have been better in any way. I think the management team have done very well to navigate the COVID situation and to get the business where it is today. But I, I was feeling like I would make different decisions about some of the stuff that was happening. And I found it really stressful to be running this team and be responsible for all of this stuff, but not being able to actually decide the direction in which my team was being sent to run, I guess. I think I wanted to work in a slightly different environment as well. Monzo was a really, really awesome place to work. And I, I Katie, my co-founder at Cable, we took some of the stuff from Monzo into how we built Cable, but we also took some stuff and said, okay, we know that that was done at Monzo and we do not want to do that. So, you know, there are, there are always pros and cons to businesses, I'm sure, for Cable as well. So I went back in January of 2020, decided I just didn't want to stay. And I spent a couple of months trying to work out whether I wanted to go work for somebody else, another startup, or whether I should actually just do my own thing. To boil it like right down to the basics, what my job was, we were in what's called the first line of defense of a bank. So we were building financial crime controls to try to identify fraud and to identify suspicious behavior. So we built the entire onboarding journey for the bank, the, the customer facing experience of I'm signing up for an account, I'm submitting information, the bank is verifying. So the financial crime detection team was actually doing the onboarding? There were product teams involved in, you know, how should we make this screen look? But we were saying, okay, we need to request this information at this point in time. You cannot move forward until you get these results back and so on. And that's because getting that information helps catch people early on in this like journey of committing some kind of crime. And it's a regulatory requirement. So you have to know who your customers are. So you have to gather certain information, you have to verify it. And then we also built transaction monitoring in-house. So we built a whole system to try to identify those suspicious activities. We built controls for account takeover or for 3D secure, that kind of verification flow if you're buying something online and you get sent to your bank. Like we built all of that. And we thought we were pretty good at stopping crime. We found really interesting stuff. We were identifying there were all these times where like, we would see this money come in and we would stop it. Our automated system would say, okay, I'm going to stop this 50K payment because the, the system thought it was crime. And we would review it and we'd be like, yeah, this was fraud. The bank that this came from, I don't know, HSBC or Barclays, their customer was defrauded and this money belongs to that customer. We should send it back. And we'd call or email the bank and we'd say, you know, we've, we've got some of your customer's money. This is crime. And the bank would be like, no, 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 it's fine. You can send that money on. And we'd be like, no, it's really crime. It's it's fraud. You want this money back? And they'd be like, no. And then like three days later, we'd get a call being like, oh, that money, that was stolen. Please, can you send it back? I was like, well, yeah, we've got it for you. Thank goodness. And that happened a lot. And we, we felt like we were pretty good at stopping crime. But we didn't know because criminals never tell you, you know, here's my annual report for how much money I laundered through you. <laughs> yeah. um, no one tells you that, right? And there is another regulatory requirement that banks have to independently test if your controls are working. How effective are your know your customer checks and your OFAC screening? How effective are your transaction monitoring rules? Are you doing all the stuff that you're supposed to be doing and how well are they working? And those things are basically like know your customer KYC is making sure it's a real 
person, real business entity with like commercial purposes. That's essentially what KYC is, right? Yeah. So it's gathering certain bits of information and then verifying them to make sure that you know that the person you're speaking to is not only a real person, but the person that they're supposed to be. So obviously like somebody, I could steal your identity and bank as you, and you need to know that it's not actually Natasha. It's like someone's Correct. pretending. Okay. And so we, we built all of that stuff. We had Half of the team in the team that I ran were engineers and data scientists. And we spent millions on technology, buying tools, buying other checks and so on. And there was this other team at Monzo whose job was to independently test our controls. By the time I left, the team that I ran was about 40 people. That other team was like three or four people. Now I believe it's much bigger, but at that time it was Mm. like three or four people. There was no technology they could have bought and they had no engineers and data scientists. So they would manually review 10 accounts a month of our four and a half million and come to me and say, this is how well your controls are working. Randomly pick 10 accounts and then extrapolate out and say, okay, well, this means that we're this good. That's sample size. That seems way too small. And then we'd pay KPMG 100 grand to manually review 100 accounts of the four and a half million that we've had. And that's how this regulatory requirement of effectiveness testing was satisfied. It's still, still how it's done almost everywhere. So The idea that we had was, well, firstly, that's crazy and that should be automated. So the idea was, can we automate the effectiveness testing with the ultimate goal, like taking this back to the first half of this conversation and everything we talked about, our mission at Cable is to reduce financial crime. Because if we can reduce financial crime, the ability to move all that money, then we think we can reduce all these crimes and all the impact on the humans. So if we can make banks more effective, if we can actually tell them how good they are at stopping crime, then we can over time make them more and more and more effective. And then we can reduce financial crime and reduce all these impacts on the people in the world who are being impacted by financial crime and some who don't even realize that they are being impacted yet. If we can kind of level set, what exactly is the cable product and like, how does it work today? I think I kind of have an idea, but I don't think anyone listening, can you just get us all on the same page real quick? Yeah. So we have a few different products. The main product, the thing that we built that we were the first people to build, and we don't actually know if anyone else has done this yet. We've not come across anybody else doing this is what we call financial crime assurance. We take in bank data, so account level data, transactional level data, and we monitor it all of the time for any regulatory breaches, any control failures, or any indicators that controls might not be effective. And is this the sampling or is this literally all 7 million accounts? It's all 7 million accounts. So it is replacing tiny sampling. We're doing it across 100% of that customer base. And instead of maybe finding an issue in a sample, where the issues started occurring three months ago, we flag the issues in real time as they occur. So then who's the end user of Gable? Is it the kind of the compliance regulatory team at a bank? Yeah, it's usually the compliance team, the financial crime team sometimes. The interesting area that we're getting into is that the business team that wants to drive growth is often our foot in the door. Compliance teams always say no. That's <laughs> yeah, like the, no new business. Yeah, that's always yeah. the like complaint from the business team. Compliance wants to slow down. Compliance doesn't, you know, doesn't allow us to onboard more customers, release this product, move faster. And so one of our taglines at Cable is we help compliance officers say yes. So that that assurance piece is like is one of our products. We also have a few different products. I'll mention two others. The first is a risk assessment product. So it is a regulatory requirement for banks to do financial crime risk assessments to understand what risk do they have, what controls do they have in place to mitigate that risk and how how effective are those controls. And so what is the ultimate or residual risk that they are carrying? And they have to produce one of these risk assessments at least annually. And that is supposed to drive business priorities. It's one of the things that the regulators check. Almost every bank in the world does this is in a spreadsheet. And even if it's in a tool, then it is a static once a year, once every six months, static risk assessment in a tool. What we've done is we've integrated. And again, we think we're the first people to ever do this. We've integrated the risk assessment with the automated assurance tool. So if through monitoring all of the accounts that a bank has, if we find a regulatory breach or a control failure, we automatically update the effectiveness of the control and the risk assessment, which automatically updates the residual risk or the sort of overall risk that something has in the risk assessment that the bank has. And so we're changing a lot of these financial crime compliance processes from being once a year, really manual processes to being always on, always updating processes. And and they're kind of like look backs, right? It's like April of 2022 and you're doing your December 21 risk assessment or something. It's usually like trying to be forward looking. So, okay, it's it's nearly the end of 2023. I'm going to pull together my 2024 risk assessment. But what we're saying is 
we're going to give you a real time updating always on risk assessment that is based on what's happening today. And what is a risk assessment? Is it like we estimate that this is how much of something is occurring? So today, very, very finger in the air. You know, I there is a risk that we have account takeover. I think the risk without any controls in place is pretty high because we're a large bank. It's probably a five on a one to five scale. I'm going to put some controls in place to try and reduce the risk of account takeover. I'm going to put in identity verification. I'm going to put in some IP tracking and I'm going to put in some 3DS. I don't know. And I think those controls are 80% effective. So my in my residual risk, the outcome risk is a one down from a five. But these are all finger in the air. I'm going to choose a scale, one to five, one to three, high to low. I'm going to choose a way to measure my effectiveness, which again is based on tiny sampling or finger in the air. And then I'm going to come out with this end risk. What we're saying is we're going to monitor all of your customers and tell you actually how effective these controls are. What's usually the result of implementing the product? Is some of the stuff worse than expected? Like, are they able to catch problems sooner? What usually happens? Catching problems sooner, catching problems they didn't know about, catching problems that are introduced through product releases or changes. That's what's often most surprising to teams or specifically engineering mm -hmm. teams. So there are countless examples of engineering team says customer can't do Y before X happens. And therefore the control is working and you don't need to test it. But engineering team then goes and releases a new product or makes a code change. And suddenly you can do Y before X. And that's now a problem. And nobody picks it up until dip sampling in your sample of 10 accounts, you happen to stumble across account that this has happened on, which might take you a year. Whereas cable will identify that as soon as the change is made. So if I'm the compliance person that's like manning the cable dashboard throughout the day, I'll get a ping like 120K transaction. You click it to like dive in and do some research on it. And it's like an instant thing and I can immediately solve some of this stuff. Yeah, so it's like, okay, we have now identified 10 accounts that uh, you've not received a valid name for, or the date of birth might be wrong, or they've not gone through this flow of controls that you set up that we've configured for you. We put the user IDs and they can dive in and remediate those accounts right there. So this happens instantly or next day? However often the customers want us to be doing it. So we have an API, it can be done on an ongoing basis. We can also do data pools from data warehouses. We have an integration with Snowflake or BigQuery. So there's a few different ways that it could happen. So then how did you get the very first customer? What was the product like when you convinced someone to pay for this? Well, the very first so the very first customer was a free proof of concept with um, a company called Tide in the UK. And they then did become our first paying customer. We had an idea, we knew what we wanted to do, and we persuaded them to give us their data so that we could prove it worked. We took their data, we ran it through the system that we built, this really, really early product. We put some stuff in a web page for them to look at, which was like very manual for us to do and really hacky. Managed to find value for them in this data, managed to show them how effective their controls were. They're now on a, a new two-year contract. They've been using us for over a year already and we renewed them recently. So then how much do people usually pay for something like this? Is it like a couple thousand a month, a year, six digits? Like what are the contracts? You just said you signed a two-year contract. What do these usually look like? Well, most of our contracts are two or three years. So they're starting to look quite enterprisey. We are currently pricing just like SaaS-based pricing, annual licenses that we're moving to usage-based. We're launching transaction assurance. So we have been taking in the account level data and monitoring for the regulatory breaches and control failures across account level data. And we're going to start taking in this quarter transactional level data too. So we'll start introducing usage-based pricing, volume-based pricing for, for that. Anytime you patch an issue, like that's what people are paying for essentially? Or? People are paying for us to be monitoring their customer base. So okay. we're monitoring it all the time. And for compliance officers, no news is often good news. And so they are paying for the fact that we're monitoring it and providing peace of mind, even if there are no issues found. Did you set a pre-seed and a seed round or what's like the status of all the fundraising with Cable? Yeah, we've raised just over $16 million so far. We've done a pre-seed, a seed and a series A. So how did you get the very first round done? At that time, my co-founder was still at Monzo. So it was me and a business plan. I still don't quite know how I got that raise. I knew some angel investors in London. One of them is Charlie Dellingpole, who had founded Comply Advantage and Market Finance before that. And he's done a lot of angel investing. And another handful of angel investors who were sort of prolific entrepreneurs in Europe. I got them to commit some money 
And then they introduced me to their favorite seed, pre-seed VCs in London. And I had two term sheets and I went with Local Globe. They've been a really great partner. Remus there has been awesome to work with. And they put the first check in. So that first round was just 675,000 pounds. So like $750,000. And that was back in September, 2020, it closed. Just one month after my first daughter was born. That was just me and a business plan and then had to hire some people. After you raised that pre-seed round, did you start adding some of the other products? No, not after then. So the pre-seed money we used to hire our initial team for my co-founder to, to go full-time and then for us to build out a very, very early MVP and get the three, we did three proof of concepts and we were turning them into um, to full contracts. And then we raised a seed round, which was led by CRV. And that one, uh, that was four and a half million dollars. And that was back in August 2021. I think that closed. So that was in 2021. And we used that money then to build out our team and actually build a lot more product. Something that we learned that was kind of interesting was people don't like buying compliance products unless there's a lot of compliance products. Compliance officers are conservative people. And they're not going to put money towards something that necessarily looks and feels really, really early in like a startup. So we had to just build more stuff to be able to sell to these conservative people and to get budget. So that's what we did with the seed money. We built a lot. We started signing more customers. We started building some repeatable processes. And speaking of CRV, so I asked Caitlin, who I think is on your board at CRV. She is, yeah. She said uh, you had a very interesting approach to how you did the seed round, specifically with all the angels that you brought on. Can you kind of talk about your process? Yeah. So this the pre-seed round was, I think there were eight angel investors. They were all white men. And at the time I was like, awesome. People are giving me money. They're like really experienced, like just take it. And then I, we raised that money. And then I was like thinking about the next raise. And I was like, oh my gosh, my cap table is like totally one-sided and not diverse at all. And so we very much wanted to approach the seed round and completely changed the makeup of our cap table. Three, four months before we started really going to market to try and raise that, that seed round, I started talking to angel investors and trying to get introductions to angel investors that one, were more diverse, but two, had been operators in areas that I did not have experience in and that Katie did not have experience in. We managed to completely diversify our cap table after that seed round. It was 52% female, way more diverse in, in ethnicity and race and sexuality as well. Um, there's a blog post on our website that shows how that all sort of fell out. It was I was really happy with how that how that came about. But also we brought on people who had founded companies and were experts in fundraising or go to market and marketing and so on. And they've all been really, really helpful to me. And then did you have any thinking around minimum check size? I know some people you'll see specifically in the fundraise, like, oh, minimum of 100K. I found at least what I've heard from and me personally in my own fund. Someone invests a thousand bucks, but they're like the highest ROI of any check. Did you find that's the case? Absolutely. Like my most valuable angel investors, so I think some of them put 2K in, some of them put 5K in. It's not only like you're cutting off valuable uh, resource because like they are often the most useful, but also it's just really discriminatory. Like a lot of people don't have 25 or 100 grand to put in. And if we're talking or thinking about trying to, you know, lift everybody up and give equal opportunity, then you have to give opportunity to the people who don't have 100 grand, but may may one day have that money. So I definitely did not set a minimum check size. And those smaller check angels have often been the most helpful. The interesting feedback I got too, when I was trying to get into venture and VC, people I call just start angel investing, right? Just like 10k, 20k. I'm like, I got like two grand in my bank account total right now. That's a little, little tricky to know. That's, I like that you're, that you're thinking about that. So then after raising the seed round, you said you built out a lot of the product, prioritizing roadmap, things like that. It was basically figuring out what your customers wanted, what the compliance officers needed to convert and pay. It was just like a fully stacked suite, just like a ton of stuff. Didn't feel like a startup. That seems like a tricky thing to balance. How did you go from a scrappy startup to a polished product so quickly? Was there a secret? So it's still definitely being polished. Um, there's lots that we're doing. No secret, just uh, a lot of hard work and trying to move really quickly. So we listened to what customers want. We built out the risk assessment product, actually, because some of the people that we were talking to said that they'd pay for it before we built it. So we were like, we'll obviously build that. We've always had this really interesting way that we imagine integrating these things. If that's what people want next, we'll build that. 
that risk assessment product actually drove a lot of our then expansion into partner banks. So the banking as a service space, there has been a lot of noise um, by regulators recently because the regulated banks who are partnering with all the fintechs, they have to understand how effective the controls are of those fintechs. And it's really hard to do that today, especially by dip sampling. It's just impossible to scale the team at the bank to dip sample over 5, 10, 15 fintechs and however many customers they have. And so we built out some specific features and products for partner banks, banking as a service banks. So we've built a way for them to onboard their fintech programs. There was a, uh, a regulatory order against a bank called Blue Ridge, where the regulators were telling off Blue Ridge for not understanding how the, the risk assessments for each of their fintech programs, but also how those risk assessments fed into the bank's overall risk assessment. And so we built, again, we think we're the first people to do this, a risk assessment tool for partner banks, whereby they can onboard their fintech programs, have their fintech programs complete these risk assessments, and the risk assessments roll up and change automatically the risk assessment of the bank itself. So we've built a bunch of features specifically for banking as a service banks. So we're, we're continuing to build out features for them and their fintech programs. So pre-cable, that portfolio, the fintech's portfolio was possibly a black box that they didn't quite have visibility into. Yeah. And then they were trying to do maybe quarterly dip sampling, requesting data dumps, very, very painful emails, spreadsheets, just a lot of back and forth, a lot of manual work with limited visibility. So you basically a lot gave them visibility and then instead of dip sampling, it's like entire portfolio, like each customer level. We sell to the partner banks and they are making their fintech programs integrate with us because then the bank has complete visibility into how their controls are working. Obviously, you raised a Series A. What was the process like of raising a Series A then? So I was very, very lucky because I uh, got preempted. Well, the round closed in April. Uh, so I got preempted in about February, end of February 23 in this market felt like very, very fortunate and to be preempted by two funds that I really wanted to work with and I had been getting to know for a long time. So we were thinking we would go to market in April to raise our A and I was speaking to stage two and to jump capital and both asked if they could preempt right at the end of February. And I said, yes, within two weeks, we had a signed term sheet. And four weeks after that, we had closed the deal and money was in the bank. So yeah, stage two and jump capital co-led the round and they've been just amazing partners helping in any which way that they can really, really happy with them. So what does the process look like of getting preempted for a round? Like people who don't know what that means, what, what does that mean and how does that happen? It means you are dating VCs and trying to like lead them on without telling them that you're leading them on. It's like the weirdest <laughs> thing ever. And uh, I definitely okay. am not an expert in fundraising, but you're talking to all these VCs and the ones you like, you try and drop little crumbs that actually you're going to, you're going to try and start fundraising soon. And, you know, are they interested? Do they want to take a look beforehand? Do they want the opportunity to, to maybe come in and lead the rounds without you having to go to market? Because you don't want to go to market. You don't want to run a, a month long process trying to speak to 50 firms because that's exhausting and time consuming and takes you away from building the business. So I seemingly successfully dropped some crumbs for both stage two and jump to pick up on. And then they both asked if they could preempt. They just said, you know, can we have a chance of preempting this? And I said, yes. Asked them what information they needed. We had pulled together a small data room. They reviewed that. They provided some term sheets. We had a, a couple of calls with their partners. We signed the term sheet after a day or two of negotiation about some of those terms. I was very, very clear that if they were going to preempt, it had to get done within four weeks. Is there anything you would change about how you built Cable so far? Any mistakes? Loads and loads and loads of mistakes. I don't know if there's anything I would change fundamentally now. I think the thing that is hardest to do, and it's still hard, and I wish I had been told this and like had it drummed into me before, was just to try to enjoy it. Being a founder of a tech startup is like being punched in the face every single day over and over again, and then having to go on calls and smile all the time. It's so painful and it's so hard. I wish that people had told me before just to try to enjoy all the little bits. Because I wouldn't want to do anything else. I do love it. And even though it's painful and feels like I'm being hit in the face a lot, it is still probably the best thing for me that I could be doing. Why is it so good if it's just painful and you're getting punched in the face? What do you like about it? I like being able to work on something that I actually think will change the world in a positive way. I like building a company that I would like to work in, trying to give people a place to work that I think they truly like to work at. And I like to try to prove people wrong. I like to try to prove that you can build a company not in the move fast and break things kind of way. We treat people very differently. 
we have our operating system, we have quite a unique culture. And I think that trying to prove that you can do this with that kind of culture and mindset is also something that I'm really trying to do. Do you have a founder, CEO, company, any of the three that you really look up to that you've gotten a lot of inspiration from? There's no one. I think there's like there's a handful of people. There are there are two of my angel investors who are both founders who stand out. One is Laura Speakerman from Alloy. So Alloy is a another reg tech company. They built identity verification and onboarding flows, and they also do transaction monitoring now. But she is an angel investor, and she also has a young kid, and will always reply to my emails almost immediately. Endless introductions, help, advice, tips conversations, always willing to chat with me. And I don't know how she does that and run a company and have a kid. And everybody who I've spoken to who works at Alloy absolutely loves it. So she's one of three founders. They are doing great stuff there. And I really, I really admire how she's able to kind of manage everything in her life. And another one is is another angel investor of mine who has been running a startup and they've just decided to wind it down. But the reason I really admire her is because it's very easy as a founder to pin your whole identity to the company that you're trying to build and think of like the extraordinary failure that would happen if it all falls apart and you can't raise money. Actually, like it's just a company and I have a family and I have kids and those things are incredibly important to me. And like if cable doesn't work, everyone will be okay. And it's really hard to forget that. And this this angel investor of mine, she is having to wind down her company and all the conversations we've had about that. Like she's been so positive about it and she's been so passionate about what she's been doing, but so able to kind of separate out what is just a company from like the rest of her life. And I just, I think that is so important to do as you're trying to build a company and do this crazy thing that we've all decided to do for some reason. Do you have a favorite interview question at Cable that you like to ask? I do. I'll tell you the question I ask every single person that joins Cable, but I'm not going to tell you what I look for because then everyone will know how to get a job at Cable. The question that I ask everybody is to tell me their story. And I say, don't just tell me your work story. I'm not just interested in your resume. Just tell me your whole story. That's the question I ask everybody. And you do not want to follow up on that? I do not. You'll have to apply for a job at Cable to to hear why. All right. What's the website again? Cable.tech? That's right. Okay, cool. Well, we'll throw a link in the show notes. Well, this has been awesome. Thanks for coming on. This was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for listening. If you want to support the show, the best way is leave a review, like, comment, subscribe, follow, listen to every single episode and every platform multiple times, and share it in the group chat and Slack groups. If you don't want to miss an episode, subscribe to the newsletter in the show notes, and you'll get new ones in your inbox the moment they drop. Thanks again for Natasha for coming on, for SecureFrame for their support, and to you for tuning in. I hope you learned something new. I'll see you next time.